Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 241, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Chuckles, that is Chuck Boucher. This part of the interview, we talk about the game he's least proud of, 2400 AD, a few other games, uh, then we talk about his work designing video game installations for amusement parks. Really, really, really cool stuff. I know you guys will enjoy that. And then uh, we also get his thoughts on Oculus Rift and the uh, future of the video games industry. So a lot of great stuff in this episode. So without further ado, here is Mr. Chuck Boucher. Uh, 2400 AD, a 1987 top-down uh, role-playing game. Uh, what's, you know what was going on behind the behind the scenes with the uh, creation of this game? I was trying to go more with the uh, role-playing there, and and that that's what uh, I came up with. <laughs> um, that's the only game that you signed Chuck instead of Chuckles, right? I yes, it is. I did go the, with Chuck Boucher for that one, and um, I guess I was trying to grow up. When would that have been? Uh, now we're moving to eighty-seven. I was a uh, whole twenty-seven years old. <laughs> Time to take life more seriously. I think I'd move beyond Chuckles, but um, so that that's all that that was about. Um, now, did that game use an, an enhanced version of the Ultima 4 engine? No, no, no. It was all my own. It was all uh, from scratch. And then John Romero did the C64 port? I think he did. There were several ports. There were some ports started and abandoned, I think. But I think we released Commodore 64, and John Romero did it. And I think we released IBM PC and... Some trivia, I believe, that uh, James Van Artsdalen programmed that. He later was involved with Dell and uh, eventually eventually retired a very, very wealthy man <laughs> after getting out of computer games and doing engineering for uh, Dell Computer. So that's the game. It came with three lead fig figures and a fold-out map, correct? Yes, it did. So it sounds like everything was in place for this game to be a big hit, but you know, I guess the sales weren't what anybody desired. What, what happened there? What do I say? Well, people didn't like it. It was uh, I didn't uh, turn out a game that people liked. You know, it. it uh, I guess it was too. You know, if I had to think back, formulaic. Uh, the Ultimates were always very free form. I mean, it, it, where, where do you? How do? How do I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't it sell as well as Ultima? It wasn't as good. Oh. People didn't like it. <laughs> well, looking back on it, would you have done made different decisions? Honestly, uh, the honest to God truth is that I've been doing this a long time, and I'm still making uh, entertainment products. Mm -hmm. But there are better designers than I am. I'm a really good implementer, a, a, a really good uh, technician really creative on how to solve the technical problems. And I can design games, but there are people that are far better at it than I am, and I'd rather today, I'm far happier working with the top-notch designers who don't care to make the games, and then together we turn out some pretty kick-ass stuff. What about 1989, uh, a game called Omega? You know, somebody wrote in asking about this, and I'm not... Yeah, what was your relationship to that game? Omega, I believe I did 89. I start, that That was uh, programmed by a now, still a friend of mine, Stuart Marks. And um, he was working with us. We got to know Stu. He was working at the computer store at the Dobie Mall, I believe, at University of Texas before we started Origin. And... Um, We'd stayed in touch. He he did that. That was kind of a, tra a tragedy. It was a really cool game. It, it was a Robot Wars kind of mm -hmm. program your own robots and let them go into arena play. Uh, my work on that, I started to do the port, and I don't know how far I got through. I, I think I was porting it to um, probably 
Commodore 64 by then uh, because the, the Atari, we way back when we start, we would roll out the Atari ports first and then it, the numbers were such that it, as the years went on, the numbers got better for the Commodore. But I think going by the timing, I had I abandoned that because I had decided I wanted to finish my a bachelor's degree before I turned 30. And so I kind of dropped out of work to go back to school at, uh, well, it would have been 29, I think. I, I graduated uh, May of 1990 and turned 30 in September. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I... I, I uh, had to tell Stu, hey, look, here's everything that I have, but I can't finish this because I'm going back to school. I don't even know if I'm credited on that. Ah, uh, saw on Moby Games are credited as, as uh, in terminal for... interface, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I did parts of it. So you're still doing work with Craniac Entertainment, the the old gold company, right? Craniac Entertainment is alive and well. I. Um, so yeah, the '80s that was the heyday with the Apple with the 8-bit uh, computers. The '90s, I, uh, I actually continued to do some work. Had a couple staff positions. Um, I actually did contract work in on Wing Commander. Um, really? But uh, yes, I did. I what did part some, of that? What part did you uh, do? Gra very little. I was doing uh, graphics, some of the high-performance graphics primitives for Wing Commander. Um, That's really saying something. <laughs> Well, a lot of it, a lot of it was already done. Chris knew what he wanted to do, and and um, so I was there. I'm happy to. Yes, it, it's good. To, I I can say that my code is in there. Um, Are you keeping up with this new Kickstarter project? I was thinking about it the other day. Day that I haven't looked. I uh, get the press releases about Shroud of, Shroud of the Avatar from Richard. I don't know what if if what approach Chris is taking with the uh, PR marketing. So I haven't had nothing is dropped by on my, onto my desk, but I was thinking, you know, I need to take a look and see where that's where that is these days. I saw him uh, when he was launching the uh, Kickstarter. What was it, a year and a half ago, or something, something like that, give or take. But uh, yeah, so I, I I did some work with Velocity here in San Francisco in the mid '90s. They had the first, as far as I'm aware, the first land-based home game. Um, Zatrix, I did, a, did some work with in LA. We uh, one of their big ones was Redneck Rampage. Um, <laughs> so very well. Yeah, who doesn't like that game? Or what's that? So who doesn't like that I, game? Exactly. Like I didn't do. I, I I helped. That was just as I was leaving. Um, helped do the, them, them with some original technology, laying out the uh, te technologies that we were going to use, and then I ended up. With my first, uh, lately, I have been for the last 10 or 15 years doing more location-based gaming. And so I left Satrix and worked with them to do a project for um, Sega Gameworks, which I think is still in business. We did, but, but basically location-based games, which is my real passion. I love that stuff because it, I get to combine making the games and the hands-on engineering aspects. Mm -hmm. And uh, so lately, I've got several projects, uh, attractions that I did the software for at Epcot and the software for the centerpiece of the kids space for Disney's two uh, new, brand new cruise ships, the Dream and the Fantasy. Wow. So that's all as uh, Craniac Entertainment. Now somebody had written in to ask about the Terminator 2 3D installation. That was a lot of fun. That was the second job, the second theme park location-based job that I got. And uh, fascinating experience. I lived in Osaka, Japan for six months. You speak Japanese? I do not. But uh, I picked up, you know, you pick up half a dozen words. I, I did learn quickly uh, two things, at least in Osaka, where often it's hazy and the subways and the street layouts are crazy carry a compass because that way you can pop out of the subway and always know where you're going and um, read and write the kanji numbers because it was very easy to find one restaurant, you know, a $5 noodle place next to a $200 uh, plate fixed price menu restaurant. Wow. 
And and so as long and, and the numbers more often than not were not in, they're not Arabic numerals they're they're kanji. So I did get to learn you know I did learn that they would get that's easy. But but the Terminator Two my pro, my job there was as the controls engineer and, and I was uh, supervising a half dozen vendors uh, testing and adjusting uh, twenty different special effects for the Terminator Two 3D attraction in Osaka. Fascinating work. Um, I'd love to do more of that, and not any programming at all. Got to it, 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 more engineering and safety analysis. Yeah, I can see why you would prefer something like that. It seems a little more tactile and hands-on yeah. than uh, just straight-up games programming, right? Yep, yep, and that's definitely where I'm happier. So, um, actually, I worked with some of those guys later on a project it's on I think it's on my project list online um, we were building a large device which was supposed to take pre-constructed houses and move them around hmm. but I, I, I think that got canceled I was going to ask you uh, controls engineering and what you're planning to do uh, or what you're working on now or what your plans are for the future I'm I suppose we can look look for that auto auto dual Kickstarter project anytime <laughs> well that uh, no, no, and that reminds me of the whole bit about. I still wonder. I never I wonder about auto assault, mm -hmm. and it kind of breaks my heart that that just didn't go much of anywhere. I didn't play it, so maybe there's some comment, <laughs> <laughs> some circular uh, reasoning there. But uh, if there was ever going to be an auto duel online, that that. Uh, should have fit the bill, but um, actually, I think I was reading that it was just to, it, it, and this goes back to the reality versus ease of play mm -hmm. comment that it was just too hard to play. Um, and so I'd be very careful before I tried to do something like that. I mean, an, an, an auto duel, like a car battle game. I think today, the online, if you can do it right, it's got to be multiplayer online <laughs> um, but there's that I'm looking for right now I'm, I'm I have a client now and I'm doing a website which is killing me I'm, <laughs> I gotta do some entertainment stuff oh. but it's paying the bills and that's fine um, amazing technology I did a project recently with the connect um, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the, the more location-based things, and, and uh, a client approached me. They wanted some special effects to build in. To, to, they wanted to do some film footage of a band to uh, plot to use in a music video. And so that's not really set yet, so I, I hesitate to mention anything by name, but that was a lot of fun. Um, so a little bit of connect work. I got my uh, Oculus Rift SDK that I've been playing with. Oh which, wow! Yeah, what you think of that? I think it's amazing. I have been um, let's rewind the clock twenty five years. Uh, is that right? 90, yeah, in, in 1990, 91, After I graduated, I built in my garage. I designed and built my own head mounted display uh, with head tracking. I used articulate, an articulated arm and shaft, six shaft encoders for six degree of freedom head tracking. Um, they were Sony Watchman TVs that had a three inch display that you could take apart and just give it a voltage and video signal and you get video. Problem is they were too big. So I actually had to you know, tilt them and build prisms and all of this. In the end, I figured, you know, they, it ran, it, it was operating spent three thousand dollars on a silicon graphics uh 3d graphics card that did i don't think it even did garrow shading it did flat shading <laughs> um in the end i figured there are people make is spending far more money on this technology that i will ever be able to so what, what am i doing so I, I i canned the project but i've always been watching that technology and Today, I have thought lately that we have the resolution and the sensors today to do this, and these guys have pulled it off. And, and in fact, they're using the optics that they're using are derived from expired contracts from the 80s. The technology's in concept has been around um, 
all the head mounted displays that were out that came out with the whole VR craze, I guess, in the late 90s, they were terrible. The field of view was terrible. They, they, they're, you know, the marketing would say, yeah, it's like watching a 60 inch television from 12 feet away. Well, I'm thinking, that's no good. <laughs> that's not immersive. Have you looked at a Rift? No, I haven't had the pleasure. It's pretty amazing. The vertical field of view is all, the constraint is almost your eye sockets. It's, it's a little bit, it's not, you, you don't have quite your full vertical field of view and, and the horizontal field of view is kind of like a, a diving mask. Mm -hmm. And it's very immersive and it's only going to get better. The critical problem with the, the, the immersive displays is the fact that you can't see your hands. It's your interface devices. You can't, um, you, you can't see the keyboard that you're interacting with. Oh, yeah, that's a big problem for and touch typists, right? <laughs> it really <laughs> is. So if, if you got a joystick, that's great, but people are working on like omnidirectional treadmills for all of this and, and uh, I don't even know if that, I, I don't see that working with games just because you want to run around, jump around too much with games, but uh, like for a walkthrough um, tour, it might be good, but but the opportunities that are coming that, that are going to open up with that, I think it, they, it's got to be pretty amazing as time goes on, and the, the video resolution is going to increase. Um, but the field of view is all there. It's amazing technology. If if we can get through, I think the major the major th hurdle is um, user interface. Well, I'm telling you, I'm seeing this Oculus Rift Auto Dual Kickstarter. <laughs> well, that's what yeah, you. I you pledged to that. Feel it's like, you know, that would be something. You know, drive. Yeah, you, you, you've got your steering wheel, and and actually, as far as inter interface goes, well, if you had a steering wheel, I mean, that that would be the the it's close enough, and you could model that in your view, and all. But yeah, to be, actually be able to turn, look around, and then see what's around you, the the Potential is pretty high. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to? Uh, is there anything else you wanted to cover here? We covered quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've dabbled a bit. Um, I think that's it. That's I it. I usually ask people what uh, what advice you'd have for aspiring uh, game developers, or I guess in your case, uh, game engineers Ooh. or entertainment engineers. Ooh. My advice isn't very inspiring. Oh. <laughs> My advice is you know, you know, be a dentist or a lawyer. Save your money till you're 40 and then do what you want. It, 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 my comment on it, it, today, game development is not what it was 30 years ago. And it's, it's very, very fulfilling if you find the right job. The hit stories that you hear you don't it, it are great, but you don't hear about the thousand um, crash and burn stories that there are for each hit. The um, it's a voc vocation of the heart, like teaching. Teachers are way way underappreciated and underpaid because there are so many people that will do it at any cost, and I think that's a really accurate way of describing a lot of game development. And so if you go into it, don't do it for the money. <laughs> if you make the money, that's great. But you got to do it for the heart. <laughs> How's that? Is that not so depressing? That sounds great. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective or perhaps a new interview. Uh, whatever it is, though, guys, I know you'll enjoy it, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much, guys, from the bottom of my heart. If you have supported my efforts at preserving video game industry, collecting these interviews with 
uh, legendary game designers like Chuck, Chuckles Boucher. If you'd like to support the show, guys, I really, really appreciate it. And any amount of money is fine, a dollar a month, uh, whatever you can afford. I really appreciate it. You'll keep these uh, episodes coming. So if you want to sign up, just go to the Patreon link in the show notes there. And this will also give you access to a, a monthly podcast, Google Air Hangout, and all kinds of really cool stuff. So anyway, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, guys, to all who have supported me. Uh, let's see. News from the Matt Cave. Uh, first, a kind of wacky item. Uh, somebody has uh, created a Game Boy emulator inside the Oculus Rift. Totally pointless, but I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, Shane O'Brien did that, uh, so you can go check that out. Uh, also, Dave Gilbert, who I interviewed a while back, has released uh, Blackwell Epiphany. This is a classic point-and-click or point and -click adventure game style. Uh, if you like that sort of thing, uh, you really want to check this out. He's probably doing the best work with uh, the Adventure Game Studio of anybody out there. So definitely want to check that out if you're into adventures. And then lastly, uh, the I, I found this on Opposable Thumbs today. They've gone to the apparently the biggest arcade in the U.S. is in Chicago, which is not too far from where I live. So I'm thinking about making a, a stop there. But it's a inter, it's a uh, arcade called the Galloping Ghost. And they got really nice pictures of this. So if you're anywhere near Chicago, I thought I would share this with you. Maybe you can make a little detour to, uh, to see it. If you do, I'd like to see your pictures there. You know, who knows? Maybe at some point we can design or uh, plan a Matt Chat meetup there. It'd be pretty awesome. So the only other news item I have, uh, I'm actually and now the proud owner of a signed copy of Planescape Torment. One of my favorite uh, role-playing games, as you know if you've watched the uh, channel for a while. And uh, Chris Avalon, uh, not only did he sign it, but he drew some fun cartoons, even stuck a couple of post-it notes on it that he drew some more <laughs> cartoons for. Uh, show some respect for the hair. It's, it's really fun stuff. Uh, you know, it just means really a lot to me that he was willing to do this. And I, you know, I only wish that I could just uh, thank him personally for this. Oh, Matt, I, I am here. I've actually been uh, sitting on your computer for quite some time, and whenever I hear flattery or praise, I immediately pop up. But, Matt, uh, the sign box was my pleasure. And you know what? Thank you for Matt Chat. Josh. Josh is very, very, very sharp. His intelligence frightens me sometimes. <laughs>